Glory to Jesus Christ. Dear friends, as the Byzantine Catholic Seminary, we form leaders for the church who continue the mission mandate of our Lord Jesus Christ to go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, that they may have the light of life. I am Father Robert Kipta, and it is my pleasure to serve as the rector of the Byzantine Catholic Seminary of St. Cyril and Methodius. On behalf of our Metropolitan, board, staff, faculty, and student body, I'm happy to greet you and welcome you to our 21st annual lecture. While the COVID pandemic continues to interrupt our plans for an in-person experience, we are grateful for this opportunity to present our lecture live to an international audience, not ceasing in our petitions that God grant us strength, healing, and hope during this challenging time. It's such a beautiful day in Pittsburgh today, and I'm so sorry we're not able to be together in Pittsburgh. We will look forward to that next year. Our Holy Father, John Paul, Pope of Rome, referred to our patron, St. Cyril and Methodius, as authentic precursors of ecumenism. Fittingly, these annual lectures provide a platform for scholarly and ecumenical discussion while strengthening unifying spiritual bonds between people of faith. As we endeavor to hand on the tradition of the Christian East, we expect that our graduates will enrich the life of the church and engage the world in theological reflection, dialogue, and witness. Looking with hope to the service of the church's future leaders, ministers, and scholars, our Seminary of St. Cyril and Methodius is pleased to announce the following graduates who have, over the past year, completed all requirements for the granting of their diplomas. James Corcoran, Master of Arts in Theology. Reader Christopher Devell, Master of Divinity. Subdeacon Timothy Ferris, Master of Divinity. Deacon Miron Kirokimets, Master of Arts in Theology. Eric Ortiz, Master of Arts in Theology. Peter Wingerder, Master of Arts in Theology. Subdeacon Kiprian Wojciechowski, Master of Divinity. Commencement this year is all virtual and you should see a tribute to our spring graduates through our website very shortly after this lecture. Congratulations, graduates. The Byzantine Catholic Seminary is now pleased to announce that we will become the publisher of Eastern Churches Journal, effective with volume 26, after being founded and published since 1993 by Eastern Christian Publications in Fairfax, Virginia. I would like to thank reader Jack Figgle for his 25 years of publication and his efforts to hand on the well-known and respected journal to BCS in order to secure its publishing for the future. This will allow our seminary faculty new opportunities for publishing and will also highlight the seminary's efforts to invite leading scholars from all over the Christian world to contribute to our vision of making the tradition of the Christian East available to the church at large in order to enrich the life of the church and to engage the world in theological reflection, dialogue, and witness. As with this evening's lecture, we wish to inform, to inspire, and to enrich understanding of the Byzantine East. Now I would turn your attention to reader Jack Figgle. Thank you, Father Robert. It's a great pleasure to be with you all. And after 25 years of publication, I'm very, very pleased to transfer the Eastern Church's Journal to the seminary to continue its legacy and provide a publishing outlet for your faculty, students, and other scholars well into the future. To mark this occasion, I would like to present you with this poster of the covers of all past 25 years and hand over the ECJ to you through cyberspace. And here it comes. 
The Wonder of Cyberspace. Thank you so very much, Reader Jack, and congratulations on your incredible work with the journal, Eastern Christian Publications, and all you do for the good of the church, and especially for the necessary effort of ecumenism in our world today. The acquisition of the journal will also provide an outlet to publish the acts from what is becoming an institution at BCS, namely our biennial academic symposium. We hope this year for another successful gathering of international scholars, together with our own faculty, to present papers and publish them in our newly acquired Eastern Churches Journal. This conference has been entitled Tasting the Lotus, Reception of and Reaction to the Transmission of Latin Works in Byzantium. We anticipate significant participation from an international team of scholars between the 31st of July and the 1st of August, 2021. Please continue to check the BCS website, www.bcs.edu for upcoming announcements. And now, our lecturer this evening completed studies at the University of Toronto and the Sheptitsky Institute before defending his doctorate in Byzantine liturgy at the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome in 2013. He has been a junior fellow at the Dumberton Oaks Research Library and Collection in Washington, DC, assistant professor at the University of Vienna, visiting professor at the Pontifical Oriental Institute, and is currently a research fellow at the Center of Advanced Studies of the University of Regensburg, Germany. In February of 2018, Oxford University Press published his Liturgy and Byzantinization in Jerusalem, the first study dedicated to the question of the Byzantinization of Jerusalem's liturgy, providing English translations of many liturgical texts and hymns for the first time. Notably, this is our very first second generation lecturer, his father having presented in 2017. That we may better understand the liturgy of Jerusalem, its history, theology, and lessons for today, it is my privilege to turn you over to this year's esteemed lecturer, Father Deacon Daniel Galadza. Thank you very much, Father Robert, for your introduction. And I also wish to thank all the professors, clergy, and faculty of St. Cyril and Methodius Byzantine Catholic Seminary for the invitation to give this year's lecture. It's definitely an honor to follow in the footsteps of the distinguished scholars and clergy who spoke before me, especially as you mentioned as a second generation speaker. My joy is, of course, however, diminished by the unfortunate circumstances of the pandemic, which make it impossible to speak to you in person, to meet the seminarians, and to pray and to talk with you. Uh, Zoom just isn't the same. It can't replace being in Pittsburgh, of course. But God willing, we all look forward to better times when this will once again be possible. Most Reverend Bishops, Venerable Fathers and Mothers, Brothers and Sisters in Christ. To say that Jerusalem is fundamental in the life of Christians would be an understatement. Whether speaking of the historical place and sacred topography where Christ lived, taught, performed miracles, suffered, died, was buried, rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, or the heavenly Jerusalem toward which we all journey as pilgrims, a foretaste of which we experience in the earthly liturgy, or of Sion, the mother of all the churches of Christ, or the contemporary holy city, which is today home to Orthodox and Melkite Greek Catholic patriarchates and holy shrines, a bond with Jerusalem is embedded into the traditions of the church and the life of every Christian. This evening, as headlines about rocket attacks, deaths, and threats of war fill news channels, I would like to offer an introduction to the liturgical tradition of the holy city of Jerusalem and its theology, and to tell the story of how this local liturgy was lost, being overshadowed by another foreign tradition. 
and why that should matter to us today. The meteoric rise of Jerusalem in late antiquity from the honor granted its bishop in the seventh canon of the first ecumenical council at Nicaea to its recognition as patriarchate in the year 451 at the fourth ecumenical council at Chalcedon through the efforts of Bishop Juvenal of Jer Jerusalem gave the holy city a prominent place in the imperial Byzantine church and made it the central pilgrimage site of the Roman empire. Many of those watching today have had the opportunity to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and to visit the holy places connected with the life of Christ. At the end of the fourth century, St. Gregory of Nyssa expressed great opposition to pilgrimage, going so far as to state that, and I quote, when the Lord called the chosen ones to inherit the kingdom of heaven, he did not include the journey to Jerusalem among the good deeds. And when Christ enumerated the Beatitudes, pilgrimage to the Holy Land was not found in the list, end of quote. Despite this harsh view of pilgrimage to Jerusalem, it was precisely at the time that Gregory of Nyssa wrote these words, that is around the year 380, that a woman from what is today likely Northern Spain or Southern France made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and its environs to pray at and venerate the places where Christ's feet stood and recounted all that she saw and experienced in an unsigned travel diary destined for her sisters back home. Scholars who rediscovered the text she left behind only in 1884 have called her Egeria. Egeria's accounts express equal wonder and amazement with the holy places connected with the life of Christ themselves as with the life of the Church of Jerusalem and how the local Christians prayed and worshiped there. As Anton Baumstark noted, and I quote, Jerusalem is in fact, Jerusalem in fact exercised considerable influence on the whole of early Christian life, owing to the frequency with which pilgrimages were made in its sanctuaries, end of quote. This was not due to the great political power that Jerusalem held, for it was basically the size of a small town or village when Constantine built churches on the holy places in the second quarter of the fourth century. Nor was it due to the continuity of its liturgical rites, which had been erased and displaced along with the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in the year AD 70, and the exile of large parts of both the local Christian and Jewish communities. Jerusalem exercised considerable influence for one reason, by virtue of being guardian of the holy places. Thus, neither political authority nor antiquity were the main reason for Jerusalem's influence, but rather its closeness to Christ. This closeness to Christ influenced the way the Church of Jerusalem prayed, read the Bible, and sang hymns during liturgical services across the sacred topography of Jerusalem which in turn influenced the rest of Christendom. Like all major ecclesiastical centers of early Christendom, Jerusalem had its own Eucharistic liturgy, its own lectionary or cycle of reading the scriptures at liturgical services, and its own calendar or order of feasts and saints commemorations that gave structure to what liturgists call its stational liturgy. The earliest testimony of such a practice of stational liturgy namely going from place to place while singing hymns and reading scripture appropriate to the day and time, comes in fact from Jerusalem. Egeria described these stational liturgies, noting with enthusiasm that, quote, above all, it is very pleasing and very admirable here that both the hymns and the antiphons and the readings, as well as the prayers that the bishop recites always have such expressions that they are always appropriate and suitable both to the day that is being celebrated and to the place in which it is being done." End of quote. Egeria was also struck by the piety of the faithful who gathered daily for matins and vespers at the church of the Anastasis, meaning resurrection, or known in the West as the Holy Sepulchre, accompanied every day by the bishop. Her descriptions of the weekly vigil from Saturday to Sunday are vivid. Behold, censers are brought into the cave of the Anastasis, 
so that the whole anastasis basilica is filled with the smell. And then where the bishop stands inside the enclosure, he takes the gospel and comes to the door. And the bishop himself reads the account of the Lord's resurrection. When he has begun to read it, there is such a groaning and moaning from everyone and such tears that the hardest person could be moved to tears that the Lord had undergone such things for us. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre was a magnificent complex of shrines and churches over Golgotha, the empty tomb of Christ, and the place where the true cross was found, built by the Emperor Constantine in the first half of the fourth century. Not long before Egeria visited the Holy Land, and St. Cyril of Jerusalem preached the mystagogical catechesis to the newly baptized faithful during Bright Week. Constantine built basilicas in Bethlehem on the place where Christ was born in the flesh on the Mount of Olives where Christ taught his apostles, and in Jerusalem over the places where Christ was crucified, was buried, and rose from the dead. Pilgrims and faithful gathered to pray here. Some stayed becoming monks and nuns and forming a monastic community at the Holy Sepulchre that is believed to have eventually included urban monks such as St. Andrew of Crete and St. John of Damascus, who ended up writing some of the most beautiful hymns of the Byzantine tradition expressing the radiant joy of Pascha and the doxological contrition of Great Lent, all sung in the eight tones that embodied the wonder of new life on the eighth day. The architecture of the Holy Sepulchre allowed for the clergy and faithful other within the complex of buildings. For example, from the tomb of the Anastasis to the cross at Golgotha, which was the origin of the procession during Lithia at Vespers that we serve to this day, and from the Holy Sepulchre throughout the Holy City. Not only was Egeria impressed by the liturgical services she participated in at the Church of the Anastasis, but she notes the piety of the local Christians there as well. Regarding fasting, she writes to her sisters back home. For the custom of fasting here in Quadragesima, or that is Great Lent, is such that some, when they have eaten on the Lord's day after the dismissal, that is at the fifth or sixth hour, do not eat for the whole week until the coming Sabbath, after the dismissal at the Anastasis. But anyone who cannot do this does a two-day fast throughout Quadragesima, or Lent. And any who cannot do even this eat everything. No one compels how much anyone ought to do, but everyone does what they are able. Those who have done much are not praised, nor are those who have done less reproached, for such is the custom here. Despite the hardship of fasting, Egeria also writes of the people's endurance and determination to participate in the liturgical services. The Holy Week services that we celebrate to this day, most notably the service of the Passions of Christ with the reading of the 12 Gospels from the night of Holy Thursday to Holy Friday, was a stational liturgy with processions accompanied by sung antiphons between the Gospel readings narrating the Passion of Christ. And in fact, a modern reconstruction of how this service would have sounded in the 12th century was recorded by Capella Romana and can be purchased as a CD or downloaded from any of your streaming services, whether Amazon or iTunes or whatever. This service included hymns and candlelit procession up and down the Mount of Olives, winding its way from Gethsemane to Golgotha. The Palm Sunday procession that Egeria describes was similar. She writes, and there are very many children in these places including those who cannot walk on foot. Because they are to be carried, their parents carry them on their shoulders, all carrying branches, some of palm, others of olive. And so the bishop is led in the same way as the Lord was led then. Throughout these splendid liturgies, rigorous fasts and exhausting processions, Egeria was struck by the great rejoicing and celebration she witnessed and by the adorned and decorated churches and the large gatherings of clergy, monastics, and laity, both young and old. In a word, the liturgical piety of the faithful and the prayerful liturgical services made a great impression on her. 
Egeria's account gives us valuable, though perhaps idealized, information on the life of Christians in Jerusalem, a heterogeneous and multilingual assembly consisting of Greek and Christian Palestinian Aramaic speakers, monastics and lay people, both locals and foreign pilgrims. The situation in modern Jerusalem is very similar with multilingual liturgies celebrated by clergy from around the world and attended by foreign pilgrims and local Palestinian Arab Christians. The close bond between the sacred topography and the liturgy was felt in Jerusalem's Eucharistic liturgy, its lectionary and its liturgical calendar and became a wellspring of theological reflection on the mystery of Christ expressed in the worship of the church. In all of these cases, the liturgy had a strong local character. Jerusalem's Eucharistic liturgy was not that of St. John Chrysostom, but of St. James, the brother of the Lord, and by tradition, the city's first bishop. Its oldest extant witnesses are Greek and ancient Georgian and Armenian manuscripts from the late 8th and early 9th century, many of them copied in Jerusalem and the neighboring Lavra of St. Sabas. Although the anaphora of St. James is first mentioned by name in the 32nd canon of the Council of Trullo in the year 692, its nascent form can already be distinguished in the fifth mystagogical catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem from the end of the fourth century. The diptychs of the anaphora of the liturgy of St. James specifically mention the sacred topography of Jerusalem after the epiclesis, praying, we offer to you, Master, for your holy places also, which you glorified by the theophany of your Christ and the visitation of your all Holy Spirit, principally for holy and glorious Zion, the mother of all the churches. Not only was the anaphora of the liturgy of St. James distinctly connected to Jerusalem, but the hymns sung in the liturgy of the hours also emphasized a strong connection to the holy places where the church worshiped and where the salvific events of Christ's life took place. In fact, the origins of the Octoikos, or collection of hymns in eight tones that are sung in our churches to this day, are to be found in Jerusalem at the Church of the Anastasis. The most ancient copies of these hymns, preserved in Georgian translation in a hymn book called the Tropologion in Greek or Yadgari in Georgian, show how the worshiping community reflected upon the death burial and resurrection of Christ that took place at the same spot where they were worshiping. In the Stichiron at the Praises of Matins, in tone two of the Octoikos from Sunday in the ancient Yadgari, they sang, we praise you, O Christ, who were crucified for us on Golgotha. Your body was placed in the Anastasis and the dead from of old you raised up with yourself. They sang this hymn standing at the very place where the events the hymn recounts took place. Another stichiron in tone five at Saturday evening vespers mentions the Anastasis church, as well as the church of Zion, which was the cathedral of Jerusalem in late antiquity. At the resurrection of Christ, the heavens were opened, the ends of the earth rejoiced, Zion was beautified, the holy Anastasis was filled with grace and all the churches were filled with glory. The awesome realization that these events in the mystery of our salvation took place on this spot is further expressed in a troparion from Ode 2 of the Tone 3 canon for Sunday. By a tree came the fall in paradise, but here, because of you, Christ, a tree is venerated, upon which you stretched forth your hands and raised up Adam from the fall. Here, refers to the church of the Anastasis in Jerusalem, where these hymns were composed. In general, many hymns that we know and sing to this day originated in Jerusalem at the church of the Holy Sepulchre, rarely mentioning the cross, the passion and suffering of Christ and the tomb without in the same breath, remembering the resurrection of Christ. The emphasis on the here was coupled with the frequent repetition of today in hymns and prayers commemorating the birth manifestation, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, bringing the gathered faithful fully into the here and now of the liturgical celebration. The hymns of Pentecost 
illustrate the church, Jerusalem church's understanding of the unity of the mystery of Christ. The first hymn sung at the liturgy of St. James on Pentecost illustrates this point. The eighth century Jerusalem lectionary and Yadgari hymnal in Georgian's translation have the following hymn for Pentecost, which summarizes the whole history of salvation in Christ from his birth and manifestation to his suffering, death, descent into Hades and resurrection, ascension culminating in the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles at Pentecost. The hymn goes as follows. By your nativity, you revealed yourself as you willed. You manifested yourself as you chose. You suffered in the flesh, O our God. You arose from the dead, trampling down death. You ascended in glory, filling all things. You sent us your divine spirit that we may praise and glorify your divinity. Despite the historical approach to enumerating the events of Christ's life here, the emphasis is still on the unity of the mystery of Christ and the inclusion of the worshipers today who also have received the gift of the Holy Spirit at baptism and are called to praise and glorify God. A ninth century Greek hymnal from Jerusalem rediscovered on Mount Sinai in 1975 among the new finds provides a different hymn. When you sent down your spirit, Lord, to the apostles as they were gathered, then the children of the Hebrews saw it and were beside themselves with fear for they were hearing them speaking in other tongues as the spirit gave them. For those simple men, they had, become made, they had been made wise and having caught the nations for the faith were preaching things divine. And we also cry out to you. You came down to the earth and saved us from going astray. Lord, glory to you. Here again, the hymn is not content to simply narrate the historical event of Pentecost, but includes the faithful praising God here and now, who also contemplate the manifestation of God in the flesh. Many of these hymns are still known to us today in the Byzantine Rite. The hymns for Pentecost that I just mentioned, which were sung in the Divine Liturgy of St. James at Jerusalem, are still sung today in the Byzantine Rite, but at Vespers and Matins rather than during the divine liturgy. The Troparion of Pentecost that we know and sing at the Byzantine Rite Divine Liturgy today comes from Constantinople and goes as follows. Blessed are you, Christ our God, who have shown the fishermen to be all wise, having sent to them the Holy Spirit, and through them you caught the whole world. Lover of mankind, glory to you. The differences between these hymns in Jerusalem and Constantinople are just one example of the differences between the liturgical traditions of both cities, which were quite numerous during late antiquity. Seminarians of St. Cyril and Methodius and those watching this lecture now will be more familiar with the liturgy of Constantinople, which is similar to the contemporary Byzantine rite. Its primary Eucharistic liturgy after the 10th century, the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, attributed to the city's prolific archbishop at the end of the fourth century, has been preserved in the earliest liturgical manuscripts from the eighth century, such as the Southern Italian Epilogion Barberini Greek 336, preserved today in the Vatican Library, and edited by Stefano Parenti and Elena Velkowska. The lectionary and the calendar of Hagia Sophia, the great church of Constantinople, known today through Father Juan Mateus's edition entitled The Typicon of the Great Church, regulated the city's stational liturgy during which the emperor, patriarch, clergy, and faithful possessed through the streets of Constantinople from church to church, depending on the particular feast or commemoration being celebrated. The same major holidays of saints were celebrated on different days. For example, St. James, the brother of the Lord, and first bishop of Jerusalem, to whom Jerusalem's principal Eucharistic liturgy is attributed, was celebrated on December 26th in Jerusalem. But in Constantinople, December 26th was the synaxis of the Theotokos, an important commemoration of the Virgin Mary on the day after Christmas, while St. James' feast was on October 23rd, the day of the transfer of his relics to Constantinople in the year 415. The example of St. James is just one from among numerous commemorations for every day of the year 
that differed between Jerusalem and Constantinople. Where there was no established universal tradition to celebrate a certain saint or holy day, for example, a widespread feast of Christ or the Theotokos, a well-known date of martyrdom, or a historical event, each city celebrated the memorials of saints on their own days that had particular local significance. The same can be said for the lectionary. Each city had its own particular order in which the gospel or epistle pericopes were read, which in turn affected the choice of hymns that were sung during the divine liturgy. During the 50-day Easter season, the Gospel of John was read in Constantinople according to a semi-continuous system, beginning on Easter with the prologue from John 1, 1 to 18, in the beginning was the word, and continuing for 50 days until Pentecost. This is how it is read to this day in the Byzantine Rite. In Jerusalem, the system was different. The various resurrection accounts from the four evangelists were read at the divine liturgy during the first week of Easter, which are today our 11 resurrectional gospels for Sunday matins. Only from the Sunday after Easter did the Church of Jerusalem begin to read continuously from the Gospel of John. As with the liturgical calendar, these are just a few examples of the differences between the two traditions of Constantinople and Jerusalem, which existed contemporaneously for the greater part of the first millennium after Christ. To the casual observer, these differences may seem insignificant. For the average citizen of late antique Constantinople or Jerusalem, however, the differences between the two traditions would have been immediately noticeable. The station of liturgy of each city involved the whole population moving together in processions and people would be familiar with the way the services developed and functioned. The close connection between the feast days of the liturgical calendar and civic life meant that changes to one would affect the other. Even average citizens far from the epitome of piety would be cognizant of what was going on in church. Within such a context, liturgy was identity forming. As early as the eighth century, Jerusalem's liturgy begins to undergo the change that liturgists have labeled Byzantinization. More precisely, Jerusalem's divine liturgy of St. James went into decline and finally disappeared from practice by the 13th century, being replaced by the liturgies of St. Basil the Great and St. John Chrysostom, as they were celebrated in Constantinople. The calendar and lectionary of Jerusalem also undergo gradual transformations before they disappear. For example, the commemoration of St. James was now celebrated in Jerusalem on the day of his feast, according to the calendar of Constantinople. The hymns used for these liturgical services also changed. Byzantinization was thus the process of making liturgical practices conformable to those of the Church of Constantinople at the expense of and detriment to local liturgical practices from Jerusalem. Within this dynamic process, the divine liturgy, calendar, and lectionary that came to be used in Jerusalem were generally speaking those of the great Church of Constantinople. The result was the loss of Jerusalem's unique and distinct liturgical tradition by the 13th century, although bits and pieces of that tradition are found to this day in the Byzantine rite, known and prayed by Orthodox and Eastern Catholic churches. The same process of Byzantinization also occurred in the other Eastern patriarchates of Alexandria and Antioch, and that history was studied by Father Cyril Korolevsky almost a century ago. Taking up where Father Korolevsky and other scholars left off, I attempted to understand how Byzantinization took place in Jerusalem and why it was that the Church of Jerusalem and its faithful abandoned their liturgical tradition, a tradition which was grounded in an experience of worship at the very place where Christ's feet stood in favor of the liturgy of the Byzantine imperial capital, which had no biblical or ancient apostolic tradition. Why would Jerusalem abandon its authentic traditions? And how did this happen? The executive summary of how and why Byzantinization took place goes as follows. Since the seventh century, the Church of Jerusalem experienced multiple captivities. First, there was the Persian invasion in 614 when the true cross was carried off and the Church of the Holy Sep from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre followed soon after in 
the year 638 by the political subjugation of the Byzantine provinces of Palestine to Arab caliphs and their Islamic forces. Second, after several centuries under Umayyad, Abbasid, and Fatimid rule came the displacement of the Greek praying Christians from the Holy Sepulcher by the Western Crusaders in the year 1099. It should be noted that after the year 638, Jerusalem was never again a part of the Byzantine Empire and its Eastern Christian population became a large minority under Islamic or other foreign powers. As the situation of Jerusalem's Greek paying, praying Christians was becoming more unstable, Jerusalem's liturgical influence and importance declined, while Constantinople's prestige grew. The Jerusalem church's final captivity was the loss of its authentic lit liturgy by the 13th century in favor of a foreign imperial liturgical tradition promoted by patriarchs in Constantinople, which would later be called the Byzantine Rite. All of these captivities are constituent elements of the phenomenon of the liturgical Byzantinization of the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. With regard to the liturgical changes, the facts that can be discerned from liturgical manuscripts and historical records show that just as in other periods of Christian history, liturgical changes and trends were evolutionary, not revolutionary, meaning that they were not suddenly instituted by individual influential figures, such as patriarchs or emperors, in response to the changed situation of the church imposed by caliphs after the Arab conquest. Instead, the main protagonists in liturgical Byzantinization were scribes, often monks and priests, copying liturgical books for the Christian communities in and around Jerusalem. Many of these scribes were anonymous. Few are known by name, and even fewer have left us any information about themselves at all. And here on your screens, you can see three manuscripts where we, in fact, do know the names of the scribes who copied them. Rare piece of information. Nevertheless, the liturgical manuscripts they copied and their historical contexts confirm that the process of Byzantinization was gradual and carried out locally rather than imposed suddenly from abroad. The liturgy of St. James continued to be served in Jerusalem on important feast days into the 12th century, although its structure had been affected over time due to the rupture between its variable hymnography and the disappearing lectionary cycle from Jerusalem that inspired the themes of these hymns. Jerusalem's turbulent environment and changing topography were unable to provide the conditions to maintain its indigenous liturgical tradition. Instead, there was a trend toward generalization and universalization of the calendar and lectionary at the expense of their local character. Their closer study reveals that the Byzantinization of the Jerusalem Patriarchate was not consciously or systematically imposed by Constantinople upon Jerusalem, and that the process was a gradual and spontaneous liturgical reform. Christian Hanik entitled an article on the phenomenon of liturgical Byzantinization with the provocative question, can one speak of Byzantine unionism? Ultimately answering in the negative that Byzantinization and unionism were different. Seeing as Constantinople did not actively impose its right on other churches, and there were no church councils or canons explicitly requiring the Church of Jerusalem to adopt the Byzantine liturgy of Constantinople, it appears that Chalcedonian Christians in Jerusalem sought to emulate Constantinople's prestige and authority as the imperial capital and throne of the ecumenical patriarch, seeking support for and unity with other Orthodox Christians under Islamic rule in the Eastern Mediterranean. The destruction of holy sites, exile of Jerusalem's patriarchs, the persecution of Christians in Palestine, and the prestige of Constantinople, along with Byzantine imperial patronage, were all contributing factors in drawing the Church of Jerusalem closer to Constantinople in its time of difficulty. Even so, the decision to Byzantinize the liturgy of Jerusalem and bring it in line with the liturgical practices of fellow Chalcedonian Christians in the Byzantine Empire was made by local clergy and scribes at the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem 
and the surrounding monasteries, including Mount Sinai and the Lago of St. Sabas. This helped differentiate their liturgy from that of non-Chalcedonian Christians in neighboring Syria or Egypt, or also in Palestine surrounding Jerusalem. And so if you were to travel to Jerusalem today or turn on YouTube or Facebook and watch the live stream of the Greek liturgical services at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, you would see that the main divine liturgy would be of St. John Chrysostom, and the liturgical services would be very familiar, if not identical, to those of the Byzantine rite celebrated throughout the world. Since the 20th century, voices from within the Melkite Greek Catholic Church's Patriarchate of Antioch, Alexandria, and Jerusalem have been discussing a return to ancient forms of Jerusalem's liturgy. One of the most prominent Melkite liturgists calling for a reform was Bishop Neophyte Edelby, a member of the Cairo Circle of Liturgical Reformers in the Melkite Greek Catholic Church. He insisted upon a, quote, return to more ancient forms through the elimination of unpleasant additions that centuries of negligence and misunderstood piety have accumulated without any discernment, end of quote. Among these unpleasant additions, as Bishop Neophyt Edelby calls them, he identified both Byzantinization and Latinization as problematic, insisting that the former is as detrimental to authentic Melkite liturgy as the latter. Although for most of us, Byzantinization is a tongue twister worthy of the final round of a spelling bee, for clergy and faithful of the Byzantine Catholic and Ruthenian or Ukrainian Greco-Catholic churches, Latinization is, on the other hand, a term often discussed at parish coffee hours or in social media groups. Thus, Bishop Neophyte Edelby's comparison of Byzantinization and Latinization as analogous phenomena should help us understand how the two are related. Both refer to the influence of one important center of power on another receptive periphery and the influence, whether passive or conscious, of the former on the latter, resulting in changes and foreign practices adopted by the periphery. Allow me to turn to Latinization briefly, simply to illustrate the interaction between two rites, an interaction with which all of those listening will be much more familiar. Historians have noted, and quote here from Baumstark, that Rome was, like Jerusalem, a center of devotion, as well as, like Constantinople, a center of power, and that even in the West, political considerations were the pro primary cause of the universalization of the Roman rite. As the contact between Rome and the Kievan Metropolia grew after the Union of Brest in 1596, it was only natural that the recently united Slavic Orthodox Christians would come under increasing Roman influence, whether liturgical, ecclesiological, theological, cultural, or political. Scholars of the last decades who have examined Latinization among Eastern Catholic churches have noted that the uncritical adoption of elements that were not consonant with Eastern practice set in after the mid 17th century. These borrowings were usually made by individuals and not authorized by any church authority nor approved by any synod and that the causes of Latinization can be found both within the Eastern Catholic churches themselves as much as from without, whether in the Roman Catholic or the Orthodox churches. As with Byzantinization in Jerusalem, Latinization among Eastern Catholics is more than just a change of window dressing, going to the heart of ecclesiology, theology, and liturgical piety. The adoption of Roman Catholic devotional practices, ranging from the Feast of Christ the King to Eucharistic adoration to Marian devotions, imposes another layer to liturgical piety that obscures the theological meaning already present in the Byzantine rite. For example, the eschatology of the Latin feast of Christ the King that comes at the end of the Roman liturgical year disregards the Byzantine rite's Meet Fair Sunday, which commemorates the last judgment at the end of the year before Lent and Pascha. While adoration of the Eucharist might be an integral development of Latin devotion and piety, for the Byzantine rite, such a devotion displaces the understanding of receiving communion and the adoration presented in the liturgy of the presanctified gifts. 
Marian devotion in May makes sense for Roman Catholics. But for Byz the Byzantine rite, it's like going to a Steelers game to root for the Penguins. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's the wrong thing to do at the wrong time. Imposing Marian veneration on the Easter season displaces the attention due to the celebration of Pascha, the Feast of Feasts, the Resurrection of Christ, and ignores the preparation for the Feast of the Dormition of the Theotokos in August, which is the only Marian feast to have its own fast during the liturgical year of the Byzantine Rite. One could go on with examples, but the main problem is that these organic expressions of liturgical piety from one rite are out of place within the harmony of the liturgy and theology of another. Returning to Jerusalem, the history and theology of the Holy City's liturgy presented this evening leaves us with certain lessons to contemplate today. As we saw with the examples from Egeria, Pilgrimage and piety are central in the experience of liturgy at the holy places and the subsequent transmission of Jerusalem's liturgy to all of Christendom. The hymnography from Jerusalem emphasized the unity of the events of the life of Jesus in the celebration of the mystery of Christ. The emphasis on the places where worship of God took place involved the faithful in the liturgy in a tangible way. The examples of Byzantinization and Latinization highlight how the change of one's liturgical tradition can signal a crisis of identity and a loss of the necessary understanding of that tradition. Such a change also mistakes the universal message of the gospel of Christ for the local liturgical tradition of an important political center, making political power universal and the local Eucharistic community secondary. Father Alexander Schmemann noted the danger of the divorce between theology, liturgy, and piety, which had disastrous consequences, depriving the liturgy of, and I quote, its proper understanding by the people. Deprived theology of its living source and made it into an intellectual exercise for intellectuals. It deprived piety of its living content and term of reference, end of quote. An appreciation of the connections between liturgy, theology, and piety in the examples from Jerusalem can serve as inspiration for enacting those connections in worship, study, and devotion today. Returning to St. Gregory of Nyssa's comment on pilgrimage and piety quoted toward the beginning of this lecture, we can now see how the connection between liturgy, theology, and piety must play out. St. Gregory writes, change of place does not affect any drawing near unto God, but wherever you may be, God will come to you. If the chambers of your soul be found of such a sort that he can dwell in you and walk in you. But if you keep your inner man full of wicked thoughts, even if you were on Golgotha, even if you were on the Mount of Olives, even if you stood on the memorial rock of the resurrection, you will be as far away from receiving Christ into yourself as one who has not even begun to confess him. Therefore, my beloved friend, counsel the brethren to be absent from the body to go to our Lord, rather than to be absent from Cappadocia to go to Palestine. We all have our own Cappadocias, whether in Pittsburgh or Parma or Paris or Presham, and seek to flee from the realization that God is with us here and now. Most importantly, our appreciation for and understanding of the centrality of Jerusalem in the history and theology of the church need not be seen as advocacy for some kind of liturgical restorationism inspired by antiquity. As Father Robert Taft, the first speaker of this lecture series 20 years ago, would often repeat, history is instructive, not normative, reminding his students that there is no golden age of liturgy to return to, since the encounter between God and man takes place here and now. Saint Germanos of Constantinople, one of the great mystagogues of the church in whom Father Taft quoted and wrote about quite extensively, 
explained in his commentary on the divine liturgy that every church, sanctuary, and altar, whether in Jerusalem or in Constantinople, in Palestine or Pittsburgh, is an earthly heaven where God dwells and walks about and which represents the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Nevertheless, allow me to conclude with a request as you leave your computers or your screens after this evening's lecture. Let us not forget the clergy and faithful of Zion, the mother of all the churches. And let us pray for the peace of Jerusalem and Palestine and all the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deacon Daniel. Now we'd like to invite our audience members to ask follow-up questions about tonight's lecture. You can do that by typing them into the chat box found on the right side of the YouTube page. If you don't see the chat box, you're probably watching this on the seminary's website. In that case, click the watch on YouTube link just below the video and it will take you there. I'll be looking through the questions and reading them to Deacon Daniel and we'll try to get to as many as possible. All right, so we have a few comments already, a lot of positive thank yous. Thank you for your attention. And let's see the first, oh, one comment here, uh, somebody wrote, it's wonderful to be able to participate in this, perhaps consider making this available virtually in the future for those who are unable to travel. And uh, I, I should just point out that the, uh, all of the seminary's prior lectures are archived on the website and on the YouTube channel. So we've, going back 20 years, you can go ahead and watch them all. And it is our intention to broadcast all these on YouTube live moving forward as well. So uh, first question we have, uh, it's sort of a two-parter. Uh, I guess I'll ask this one first. Is the Melkite church Antiochene, Hagiopolite or something different? And then the second question is how can liturgical renewal and implementation be done in the Melkite church? Those are good questions. So um, the Melkite church is a church of the Byzantine rite today. Uh, a lot of Melkites might debate the exact origins since the Melkite patriarch today has the titles of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. So I know that uh, the previous Melkite patriarch, Patriarch Gregory, would emphasize the Antiochian origins and even write that the Byzantine rite is basically Antiochian. Uh, but that seems to overlook the current, for example, calendar or lectionary, which are perhaps uh, historically have connections with Antioch, but are basically from Constantinople. So. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of Jerusalem elements in the Byzantine rite. So the simple answer is that the Melkite church today is the church of the Byzantine rite, but has closer connections to both Antioch and Jerusalem than um, the church of Constantinople, I would say, especially with the presence of clergy and faithful there. And there are other liturgical scholars, apart from Patriarch Gregory or um, Bishop uh, Ed Neufit Edelby, there's also Father Nicholas Antiba, who has researched uh, a lot of these questions more recently. Now, the second question was how to implement liturgical renewal in the Melkite church in general, or based on the awareness of this connection with Jerusalem. Um, I'm not sure if that's specified there, but um, definitely, uh, I would say that in my experience, the Melkite church is, seems to be doing a very good job of liturgical renewal by um, understanding the, its liturgical tradition uh, better than a lot of other Eastern Catholic churches with very good contacts with the local Orthodox churches, which always help with liturgical renewal. Um, I don't think some kind of return to ancient Jerusalem or Antiochian practices that are known only from historical research would be um, of direct benefit here. One thing that definitely is very important is uh, preaching uh, theological education and catechesis that kind of tease out a lot of these elements that we already pray in our liturgical services, whether it's through the hymns or the scriptural reading. So just kind of a sitting down and 
examining, understanding, contemplating, and praying that which we already have in the texts of the church. And so uh, with the Melkites, that means uh, whether it's texts in Greek or uh, Arabic or English, there are great English translations that I know other Eastern Catholic churches, the Byzantine Rite, and also even some Orthodox churches use. So um, I would say just keep on trucking, keep on going. Uh, and with the example that you give to other churches. Maybe if there's a specific question, uh, that could be a follow-up, but. Um... Okay, well, here's, here's another one. Uh, somebody asks, are there any Christian churches at all, Catholic or Orthodox in Jerusalem that are celebrating according to the ancient Jerusalem rites or has it disappeared from practice? Yeah, so uh, thank you. Basically the rite as we knew it um, before this phenomenon of Byz Byzantinization is gone. There has, have been certain attempts to revive certain aspects or some people uh, go back to a recreation of the idea of how things might have looked in the ancient Jerusalem liturgy. Um, I know, for example, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate has a liturgy in Hebrew, but I think it's modern Hebrew uh, for the local population, uh, small community. There have definitely been uh, moves to revive the liturgy of St. James very in recent decades, um, but the way it's been revived has been somewhat artificially uh, and that bibli biblical archaeologists who were priests or bishops uh, put together the text they found in manuscripts and then encouraged its celebration, but adding rubrics that make it really seem like uh, something ancient when in fact it's just... Um, uh, their own creativity with uh, uh, devising how these rubrics, you know, the, the deacon facing the people to intone litanies or the clergy without uh, wearing any head coverings or the bishop just wearing a philonion instead of a sacos, which is, is understood as a later development. But these things all come from the end of the 19th century and 20, 20th century is kind of a, um, uh, you could say, biblical archaeology in action or romanticism or something like that. So the short answer is not really nobody. The Jerusalem Patriarchate does have certain local variants of the Byzantine rite, for example, things that are connected to praying at those places, be, having access to those churches, like a, a nighttime divine liturgy every night in the edicule that is the tomb of Christ, that little shrine, but um, the texts are basically those of the general Byzantine rite. Okay, excellent. We have um, another comment and, and question here. It says, Father Deacon, thank you for the lovely lecture. There is much discussion here on the Byzantinization of the liturgy, which is true of Eucharistic liturgy, but can we speak of the Hagiopolitization Constantinople liturgy in the divine praises? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And um, oftentimes, liturgical scholars talk about this cross fertilization that Jerusalem is influencing other centers of Christendom, including Constantinople, uh, because as I mentioned, Constantinople didn't really have its own particular unique liturgical tradition. It was influenced by Antioch and um, then kind of developed a local imperially connected liturgy. So the liturgy of the hours that was being spread from uh, Jerusalem uh, definitely was received elsewhere. And so this is a debate. There are quite a few scholars uh, that it's worth mentioning that discuss this, whether it's uh, Stefano Parenti uh, piggybacking on the work of Father Juan Mateus regarding one orologion that was found in Greek uh, in the Sinai library, Sinai Greek 863, which describes the Liturgy of the Hours at the church, at the monastery of St. Sabas. There's another scholar, Stig Freushoff in Norway, who works with Georgian sources and points to certain Georgian manuscripts that, that are considered to preserve older traditions at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And he has written an article recently published in Dumbart Noakes papers that points out that a lot of these things that we consider to come from Jerusalem are found in Constantinople much earlier than previously thought before St. Theodore Studite, uh, whether it's through the hymnography of uh, 
St. Germanus Patria Constantinople or St. Andrew of Crete who were active in Constantinople. So it's kind of a, a dynamic exchange and definitely there's the influence of Constantin Jerusalem on Constantinople and back and forth. But with regard to the calendar and the lectionary, which are and the hymnography, there is definitely a loss of a lot of the Jerusalem material, even in the Liturgy of the Hours. So it's, it's very complicated. Sure, actually your mention of Georgia is a nice segue into this next question. Uh, it asks, how late did the church in Georgia celebrate the Jerusalem rites? Also, did any of the non-Chalcedonian churches retain the Jerusalem rites? Okay, that's a good question. So <clears throat> a lot of these things that, uh, these liturgical manuscripts that we have to this day, are preserved in, in Georgian. They're Georgian translations because uh, Georgian monks and pilgrims would come to Jerusalem and the Holy Land and establish a presence there from the late fifth and sixth century. And so there was this contact, uh, things being written in Jerusalem taken back to Georgia and the other way, Georgia the country, not the state, just to clarify, um, out in the Caucasus. And so, there are some manuscripts that have been found there that um, date from the 10th or 11th century that still preserve some of these elements. Whether how late they were still serving these things is a good question. It seems to have kind of died out at the same time as in Jerusalem ultimately, but it's worth mentioning, uh, for example, when there was a question about um, liturgical uh, renewal among the Melkites and what is done, well, there are scholars and also the monastery of Vatopedi on Mount Athos has recently published a book of ectonies or litanies for the divine liturgy um, that are in Greek and Georgian that are variable. They're connected to the liturgical calendar. A lot of these come from manuscripts that are uh, today uh, on Mount Sinai or in Georgia. And so they have, for example, a litany at the divine liturgy that Men that is specific to a certain feast day, whether it's a feast day of Christ or the mother of God and has specific petitions. So these kind of things were preserved in Georgia and continued uh, probably on pace with uh, what was going on in Jerusalem. But Georgia also follows the Byzantine rite, just like the Melkites and everybody else so, uh, that was an inheritor. Who has, the Byzant who has elements of the ancient um, Jerusalem right today that are non-Chalcedonians? I think that was the second part of the question. Uh, definitely the Armenians have a lot of connections with Jerusalem. They have a strong presence in Jerusalem. Uh, their idea is that their orologion is highly influenced by uh, Jerusalem, although it could also be influenced by the Byzantine right. So definitely if you had to pick one uh, non-Chalcedonian church, it's the Armenians are very close to the Jerusalem tradition. Okay, I've got another one here. Is it possible that liturgical renewal is understood by many as a chipping away, that's in quotes, at elements unnecessary, again in quotes, have these discoveries instilled a somewhat lax spirit in the way we celebrate? Yeah, so uh, the question, if I understand it correctly, is liturgical renewal is seen as kind of a reduction and then laxity, that's the comment? Yeah, of course. That's, yeah, I think that's why I read it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, without having the text of the question in front of me, uh, that's your interpretation as well. Yes, definitely. Uh, oftentimes, uh, renewal is seen as kind of uh, keep it simple. I've heard uh, there's a principle like keep the kiss principle, keep it simple. Uh, to with with liturgy, don't make things more complicated. Um, Certainly the Byzantine rite can be called Byzantine in more ways than one because it's very complicated. But uh, the point of liturgical renewal or reform is to get back to uh, not necessarily the external forms of something uh, that uh, can differ and change over time, but to understand the essence of what liturgical prayer and worship is all about, which is the unit, the assembly of the faithful in the church, the gathering of the synaxis, the church, the ecclesia, in worship of God, union with God. And so if 
there are different forms of worship and sometimes it's short and simple and sometimes it's long and potentially complicated. So the goal of any kind of reform or renewal is to renew that encounter with Christ in the liturgy. So I wouldn't say, so definitely there could be some that present it only in external ways without taking into consideration the internal uh, reform, I mean, in, inside the human person, uh, a renewal of the mind and the heart uh, in this worship of God. So. All right, excellent. I think that does it for all the questions we have. Thanks again for, for answering them. And we'll now turn back to Father Robert for some final words. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Father Deacon Daniel, for your most informative talk and for broadening our perspective as to how truly rich is the apostolic church when it comes to its liturgy. Each of us is on pilgrimage and we are so blessed in our liturgical worship influenced by journeys to and between the holy places where our Lord Jesus Christ worked out our salvation. May our liturgical processions and inspired songs be efficacious in our ecstatic journey to the heavenly kingdom. I'd like to thank our seminary faculty and staff at this time for their devotion throughout the year, particularly this past year, which required of them adaptations and commitment above and beyond the call of duty. I also thank Ryan Dumont, our technical information consultant, and all those who have met the technical demands of this lecture. To all of you, our viewers, I'd like to thank you for staying with us through this lecture. May God grant you good health, hope, happiness, and a good night. Glory to Jesus Christ.